All right, sounds good, thanks Colin. Um, yeah, so I'll be presenting chapter six called The Package Within. Um, I enjoyed this chapter because um, I like to learn through examples and this I think presents a nice case study and walks you through various errors that I think are pretty plausible and that you're likely run into if you're not watching out for it. Um, I don't quite remember everyone's background here, um, but I, I'm, it's, I think it's pretty safe to say that I'm coming into this group with the least programming experience. So I do encourage people to ask questions, but um, make no mistake that I'll be probably learning more from you <laughs> than vice versa. Um, but yeah, I thought this was a great chapter to um, just to like sort of like chapter two to just get go through the basic workflow and to um, really compare and contrast how creating our code for a package is different than just running it in a script for the purposes of data analysis. Oh, sorry, can everyone see my screen? All right, cool. I think if we could bump up the text a little bit, that would be good. You, you see the little A? <clears throat> if you click the A and then bump it up, there you go. I think that's the, right there is perfect. Thank you. All right, cool. Yeah, so the first section starts with a fictional script um, for a data set of people who went for a swim. And so it's just a few people um, and the temperature outside. Um, so the example is to walk you through how you might process some of the data. Um, the observations were classified as either um, American or British based on how they described the beach or the sandy place where the water and land meet. So US people say beach or coast and people from the UK, I guess say seashore, seaside. Um, while processing this data, they also converted from Fahrenheit to Celsius. <clears throat> and Lastly, data was written back into a CSV file um, and the timestamp was also captured um, in the file. Link. So um, they say there's a package that looks within the script, um, which I guess refers to um, that um, there's a better way to, or more efficient way um, to do this, where you can just put these into functions and then put it into a package rather than repeating um, or running this script over and over again. Um, and so suboptimal coding practices like repetitive code and mixing of code and data um, were, were shown here. And then um, later on, it's shown how um, this code could be optimized. So this is the next version of the script. We, won't, we don't have to walk through it line by line, um, but they basically put all of these, everything that I described earlier into functions and so you can see here, converting um, from Fahrenheit to Celsius. And then for the other things like um, uh, collecting the timestamp and then um, putting it or storing it back into a CSV file. So the key features of this code um, is that it's using functions from tidyverse packages. Um, different beach words are stored in a lookup table. Um, this makes it easier to add words in the future and functions like um, Fahrenheit to Celsius or FTC timestamp and out file path functions um, now hold the logic for converting temperatures and forming the timestamped output file name. So the next section is external helpers. So um, moving reusable data and logic out of the analysis script and into separate files or into one or more files. Um, so this is shown here. Again, um, I don't think we have to walk through it line by line, um, but higher level helper functions like localized beach and salsify temp were added to the pre-existing helpers. <clears throat> so F to C or timestamp and out file path. Um, and the script is now much shorter and cleaner. However, um, whether it's easier to look at or to work with depends on personal preference. Um, and so it was described here that um, you can use the tidyverse guide on how to style code. And so um, I looked at this and thought it was cool um, just because coming to this as more of a beginner programmer, not really knowing on what the proper principles are. I'm guilty of just 
copying and pasting shit from Stack Overflow than not knowing what exactly it does and then looking at it months later, not knowing what I was doing. Um, that does lead me to a question for the group since we're on this topic, which is that I've heard that the best way to learn how to program is to just pick up projects and to start doing it. But people are also telling you something that's also kind of contradictory, which is to learn you know, the right principles first. And so I'm wondering um, how people went about it and you know, that supposed um, tension between having to write code properly in the first place versus just diving in into um, you know, your own projects and applying it. I think that's an excellent, excellent question. And I wouldn't consider myself an expert in this area at all, but I can speak to my own experience on it. I think just like you, you know, that's how I started was, um, how I started was just going to Stack Overflow and Googling things and trying to figure out just to get it to work, you know, to get it to work. And then once you got it to work, then you kind of go back to that process of refactoring to figure out how do you make it better. And so you follow principles like dry, don't repeat yourself. So going back and trying to find where your repetition is and trying to succinct it down, uh, focus on readability. So, um, you know, there's a difference between cleverness and readability. So yeah, it's cool to be clever, but when you pass your code off to somebody else, they may not understand your cleverness. And so thinking about readability, and that depends on what you're working in. And then um, the other thing that I found to be helpful was, you know, if something goes wrong, take the time to figure out why it's going wrong. So locate where it's happening, figure out why it's going wrong and dig into the help documentation. You know, I think of when I first started out, it was always just like, oh, I see an error. I'm just going to go straight to Google. Well, take some time to like dig into the documentation because once you like read the documentation for most packages and most stuff, that's where you really start to learn how things really work. And then the last thing that I would say before I dominate the entire conversation, because I could talk about this forever, and someone's probably going to say, Colin, there's probably a better way to do it, is like going into a different context and seeing how things are done in a different context, because it's really cool to see how like some of the general concepts just translate across all of these different like components, whether it be technology wise, coding wise, so on and so forth. The principles are the same, but they're just applied in a different syntax. And so that's like where I've kind of learned a lot is just seeing what the principles are. But that's just me. That's my experience. So anybody else want to add to that? Well, I was going to ask if you don't mind, I'm going to extend that last comment that you made uh, of context. Uh, where, are, are you referring to like different languages, like like seeing how different languages manipulate that same argument or or is that your reference there? Yeah, I mean, like, so um, I'll just be, I'll, you know, I'll self-disclose that, like, I'm not as strong in SQL as I should be. Um, you know, my, most of my data wrangling and export was going through Tidyverse. But now I'm starting to go back and review all of the SQL stuff that I need to kind of review and learn. And you see that there's a lot of stuff that translates from SQL into, like, dplyr code. And so it's like the same principles, you know, like group by aggregate, it's the same thing in SQL, but you're just doing a different syntax. So it's just picking up on those patterns and principles and then applying those patterns and principles to your own work. And that just takes experience, right? Like you just got to, and like Brendan, like you said, you just got to do it. And, you know, then you start picking up on those patterns and you're like, oh, I see this patterns apply here in this context. It's similar to how it's applied in this context. Does that uh, clarify yeah. what I said, Ryan? It does. It, it, yeah, because I was going to I was going to specify that that being knowledgeable on other languages and then their relation to R specifically and how the packaging system or the functions within a package operate. That is very helpful, but it's kind of like you're, you're climbing a really steep mountain. Um, you, you, you've got to prepare yourself for that uh, concept. I, I do very much appreciate and support the statement of reading uh, help files uh, or manual pages, right? Uh, actually digging into the, I don't, I don't want you to boil the ocean and understanding, comprehending how the computer is operating, but like, like abstracting what the function is doing or what the failure is doing. Um, I find for my own personal needs that I argue with myself, I journal entry myself quite often. 
um, whether that be Trello, Boost Note, uh, Adam, I've got my own notes on GitHub where or GitLab, where I will post a question to myself or, a, or an issue and then argue with myself as I'm trying to figure it out. I don't have a, a resource that I can expand to. Um, so for me, that is a self-guided learning practice of, of posting the argument, changing what it is I'm trying to achieve, documenting why my research isn't uh, answering the question I have until I finally stumble into the answer. So that seems to help. Okay, great. Yeah, thank you both. I think I can definitely try to follow all of those tips because I'm not doing um, most of them, um, especially, you know, um, try, really trying to read and understand error messages. So I know that was a bit of a tangent or an aside from what we're doing here, but yeah, I thought that was helpful. So thanks. Um, all right. Um, I also realized that um, I'm really zooming through all the sections of these chapters. So, um, but we're on to 6.4, which is an attempt at a package. Um, so using the create package function from use this um, to create a new R package and then um, copying the cleaning helpers R file um, into a new package. And so that was just the script you're using before to clean the data. And then to copy the beach lookup table.csv file into the top level of the new source package and then installing the package. And so we're gonna go through all these steps, um, but since we all read um, the chapters, um, we know that two of these steps lead to problems and it's these middle two. So copying the cleaning helpers um, dot R into the new package, just straight from the script um, and then um, copying the beach lookup um, table CSV file. And so this is the script that we're trying to run in this case study. And so we're declaring our two libraries, tidyverse and delta, and then um, we're trying to process the data. Um, but these are the results when we try to run the code. So we get two errors. The first one being that we can find the function localized beach. And the second mean that we can find the other function out file path. Um, and this is because despite calling our um, library called delta, none of the functions were actually available to use. This is because we only attach the package rather than sourcing the file with helper functions. So attaching a package does not put the functions into the global environment or workspace. And so we can export these functions properly by putting the uh, export in the Roxygen comment above each function. And so this would be how we properly export them. Um, and this would be the function that we want to use. And that's, um, this is in the Roxygen skeleton. So now our script, it works better, um, but we're still getting another error, um, which is in the beach lookup table.csv, um, and it doesn't exist in the working directory. Um, and the problem here is that you can't dump CSV files into the source of an R package and expect it to work. Um, you, you still can install and attach the package, um, but this shows that you can um, attach the package and use it, but you'll still run into problems. Um, to prevent this, you should um, run check often during development. And so it'll alert you to the problem. And this is what's shown here that it gives you an error. And so um, the reason behind these errors is that the package was declared incorrectly. Um, while you can load the package um, using library tidyverse in a script, dependencies on other packages must be declared in the description file. Um, so I guess that holds for both the library tidyverse as well as the Delta library um, for this script. So for the next section is a working package. Um, so now we'll see or make a package that actually works. Um, and so this is the script where, um, you know, it's um, similar to what we've seen before, except um, now we're um, properly exporting all of these functions. 
um, to clean our data and to fix our initial problem of loading a CSV file, we've created a lookup table um, to create a um, to create our data frame instead. And so um, that's up here. Um, however, chapter 14 will later provide more guidance and recommendations on how to load the data sets properly. Um, when calling functions from other packages, we should also specify a package that we're using. So for example, dplyr plier mutate, um, rather than um, using the meta package um, or identifying the meta package. So to not use tidyverse mutate, but to specify the package it's a part of specifically. Um, which does make me wonder, are there any other meta packages? I mean, I'm guessing there are, but tidyverse is the only one I know of. Um, certainly the most popular. Tidy modeling could be another one. Um, I'm trying to think if there's another metaverse package that has a bunch of sub packages built in. Uh, uh, what's the uh, book down? I think book down is another that rent, uh, calls out our markdown and a couple of other packages that uh, render your, your documents. The, in one of our cohorts, John had made a comment about uh, a good practice uh, entering the package name and then the function itself. Um, it makes for a larger collaboration because you know where that function is coming from. Um, it's not a necessity and, and there's, there's no requirement in the state you have to do that. Uh, it just makes a good habit of both you writing it and knowing where that package is, is drawn from, and then also um, kind of gaining some familiarity or, or guiding another user that may be re uh, reading or using your code at a later point. Right, okay. Okay, cool, thanks. Is DevTools considered a meta package? That's what, that was the one that came to my mind. What I'm was the sure name, though. Isabel? I'm sorry. Uh, Dev tools. Oh yeah, I think it is. Uh, well, I I think at the beginning of our book, didn't they say that they kind of split that apart into their own separate packages? But yeah, yeah initially I think it was a, a meta package. I remember in my very first package, I had Dev tools as a dependency, and it caused so many issues. <laughs> so. I guess, how would you define a meta package? You know, like, isn't, isn't every package kind of a meta package if you have dependencies? I mean, I don't know. That's what I'm thinking. Like what, how would you like concretely define a meta package? I know that the, the, the canonical one would be tidyverse, but. Yeah. I think the way I would define it is that a package that doesn't have any of its own functions, but it's only used as a container for other pack packages. So every other package is dependency. When you load that one package, you're basically just, it's equivalent to doing library like tidyr, dplyr, whatever. I like that definition. Okay, cool. Yeah, thanks for that. I was just curious. Um, all right, and so, for all of the user facing functions, um, they have an export tag, as I mentioned earlier, um, in the Roxygen comment, um, which means that um, the document function adds them correctly to the namespace file. Um, this package can be installed, um, but we receive one note and one warning. Um, so the note here is that there's no visible binding for the global variables English and temp. Um, and so for the first warnings, um, this is because, uh, and this is not something I understand at deep level, but using bare variable names like English and temp looks suspicious because you're using unquoted variable names, um, according to the package website. Um, so defining these variables globally um, eliminates the note. Um, and so we could do this. Um, from the utils package and the global variables function. Just to, just to make a point here, like I will agree that I didn't totally understand this section of the book, of the chapter, because, you know, I didn't understand why this would be flagged as an issue with just these bare 
variables. I mean, does this have to do something with quoting and unquoting? I mean, does anybody have any like experience with this? Cause like this kind of threw me off. I was like, well, why would you have to do this in a separate file? But anybody feel welcome to uh, uh, throw stones at my thought process here in C, C++, uh, I want to say some uh, another low level programming language, you define your global variables so that they're accessible across your entire main, your, your entire program, even within the functions. So the variables are passed amongst the functions. If you don't define them in a global context, they're only available in the memory of that function and they're not, they're excluded. You can't access it from another, like there's no storage for it. There's no memory allocated to store that variable after the function is finished, right? Um, I'm, I'm thinking in my mind of like, you know, the return function. Um, once the, once the, the operation is complain, uh, complete, you would return that variable back to its, its kind of shelf space so that something else can access it. Um, if you don't define that placeholder, that global variable, it's not going to fun that your, your whole code base will start to break down. Um, because the the other functions won't be able to access it. Does that make sense? Maybe of where this is coming from. Dude, I, I I'm not saying that's an answer. I'm only implying that I think that's what they're they're going after here. Yeah, I think so. And uh, so yeah, I also don't understand this, of course. But I think the way I was thinking about this is that these variables are not defined anywhere english and temp they are in some in the data frame and they're being referred to without the either a dollar symbol or uh, using double square brackets and putting them in quotes so they are expected to be since there is nothing there's no dollar sign before them it, they're assumed to be global variables, but there is they are not defined in the global environment. I think that's the problem. Uh, so I was wondering, and I think that's because of how this like base R functions work. And this is because in tidyverse you don't have to do that. So I was wondering if you define these functions, if you wrote a base R function and you defined it with like the width function. So where also you don't have to like add the dollar signs, uh, if that would also throw the same error uh, or whether it's just like the, it doesn't understand that IDverse uh, system, I'm not sure. That's a good point. I don't know oh. if that it made any sense either, so. <laughs> Well, I think, well, because I'm not as familiar with base as, as, as you are, but I mean, I think a couple of things that I kind of, I think that it's coming up as like, for me, from what I understand it is like, there is specific conventions that you need to follow if you're going to use tidyverse, you know, functions inside of like other functions. And so there's an actual vignette that's out there, you know, programming with tidyverse stuff. And so I was wondering if that has to go with it as well. So Brian might be able to to clarify my think my thought process because I'm thinking out loud right here, but is this kind of like related to like data masking with like, I don't know, like remember, remember in Shiny when we had those functions that we put into like the server, we had to follow like conventions with like data masking and unquoting and quoting. I don't know if that's related. No, I think no, that's a good comment. I don't I, I think that's a different context that it uh uh uh, programming environment or compiling environment uh, requires that linkage uh, and the use of, of quotes or single quotes, double quotes has a different uh, connotation. No, I think in this in this packaging system, the everything about R is it it it, it always drops down into even a lower level language in some form. Um, if we, I can't remember the name of the storage type. Is it S three? There's, uh, I, I think it's in the advanced R book. They make references to mem memory allocation. Uh, and uh, maybe I'm just stuck in that thought process and I apologize. What I'm thinking in, in the comprehend, uh, sorry, the, the operation of R 
as a environment to manage the functions that we're telling it to follow without having any form of way of connecting the dots of what we're asking it to do. Uh, so the, the, the error that we're, we're running with this R command um, or, or validation and, and it kicking back warnings and, and notation uh, is a reminder to us that I've found a problem with it. There's nothing I can do with this. I'm letting you know that, that if you try to run this, it's going to error on you. It's going to fail on you. Um, I, Colin, I think I, I'm trying to answer your question because that's a different HTML web development type server uh, situation. I don't think it's the same as what we're dealing with here and and running inside the the single R environment. Yeah, I felt a little off base when I made that comment. Um, but now that you bring up like, because this is coming off of our command check, which we'll get into more depth later on in the book, but you know, the warning is a note. And so a note just basically means it's not necessarily that something's wrong. It's just that you need to make note of this and possibly change it. And so um, I think that's an important point to raise too, that this isn't like a, an error. It's not like a something wrong with your code. It's just that there might be an issue with it. And maybe, maybe Rex could speak to this and I don't want to put you on the spot Rex, but like when you go through like CRAN review, if you have a note like this, do you have to address this note? And if you can't talk, just give me a, you know, yeah, I, know no, I, um, I understood that you should do your best to not have any notes. Um, I have, I have done this before in um, in one of the packages that I've made because of like exactly this. I sort of had a I had some functions which created formulas, but that was sort of a it was sort of a hacky method where it would make a string and then evaluate it as code. So there was no global binding for the actual formula because it was just a string. It wasn't actually declared anywhere until it was evaluated. Um, so I get this note unless I define the equations as global variables in the utils function. I can show you where that is. But um, yeah, I think I think I just had a really hacky solution and <laughs> it passed grand. So I don't know. They might not have looked at it. Yeah, so uh, looking at this uh, this part of the book has the as like a footnote and which points to a specific section in the uh, programming as deployer uh, vignette and that there they basically say that if we add use the dot data pronoun and add a uh, dollar sign then that note goes away. All right, cool. Um, yeah, I'll have to look more into that later. Um, I just posted this one solution to get rid of it, but I'll look into um, the other way of doing that as well. So thanks. Um, and then the other note we received from R um, was undocumented code objects. So um, our undocumented code objects were our functions. Um, and so it says all user level objects in the package should have documentation entries. And so the way to solve that is to um, document it um, using the Roxygen comments um, should make that um, warning or note go away. Okay, so the next section is build time versus runtime. And so um, another problem that we ran into um, for this package is that the timestamps don't seem to work properly. Um, so when we run our function, um, the same result keeps coming up. And so that's because the timestamp reflects the time that the function or that um, the time at which the uh, package was initially built rather than the current time, which is what we're looking for. And so um, this is because the sys.time function um, was run outside of the out file path definition. And so the result is that it's executed when the package is built, but um, never again. And so the takeaway here is that 
code outside your functions is only built once at build time or it's, yeah. Um, and then moving sys.time so that it's no longer top level code, or in other words, um, so that it's now embedded within the definition um, gets rid of the problem. And so the takeaway is that you need to have a different mindset when defining objects for a package compared to writing a script. Um, the objects should be functions and these functions should generally only use data they create or that is passed via an argument. I just copied and pasted that from the text. It's not, that's not very clear to me. The way I understand it is make sure that it's um, not top level code or if you do have top level code to make sure um, uh, that you won't run into problems later with it. But someone can correct me if that's an incorrect conceptualization. And so for the next section or the last section, which is side effects, also as a side note, um, I copied all of their headers, um, which just um, are nonsense words to represent um, it in alpha alphabetical order. Uh, so alpha, bravo, and Charlie, in case anyone was wondering. Um, so the last concern um, that we have to solve or debug is with the timestamp. So the timestamps depend on which part of the world you're in. And so I've created an example or copied their example um, where it depends, the time is different based on where you're running the code. And so one solution could be to create timestamps that are, are all in a fixed time zone. So you can force a certain locale with the sys.setLocale function and force a particular time zone by adjusting the tz environment variable. And so we can implement this. Um, however, um, for example, a user in Brazil um, would see this after using the out file path from our package if um, we were to implement this code. And so they would see, they would see this code where it's um, translated um, um, into, well, sorry. Um, yeah, it's translated into English, but also the problem is that um, the side effect here is that um, there, the environment in your R session is now changed um, because the locale has changed um, when running this code. Um, and so this side effect is undesirable and extremely difficult to track down and debug later. Um, especially in more complicated settings. Um, they didn't give an example of a complicated setting, um, so I'm not exactly sure how that would play out later. They probably didn't give it because it was complicated, but um, yeah, I'd be curious if anyone has any ideas as to what downstream problems they're talking about, because I, I buy or I get what they're saying, but I can't think of any you know, concrete instances. Um, so yeah, if anyone can think of anything, feel free to jump in. Um, I, I was gonna add, I was gonna add to that, uh, Brennan. I think what we're referring to there is this uh, system. Uh, if you don't mind scrolling back, what was the what's the function name? Uh, system locale. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, set locale. So I believe the users R environment is based on the operating system's locale. If we run this code or they run this package and it sets their R kernel environments locale to a different change. It would be in conflict with their their operating systems uh, locale, and so therefore you're going to have a, a, a really really bad <laughs> bad things happen. Um, uh, let's let's use Rex as an example. Rex, if you don't mind, since you're literally almost uh, twelve hours, ten and a half hours off of us. So if we if if I send Rex a package that says it's U.S. based time zone centric, and Rex runs the uh, code that changes his computers or his R sessions locale, it's going to start breaking things on his computer, breaking things on his on his uh, uh, R session. Um, it's because this set locale has an effect on the entire R environment and all of its sub functions that occur. Um, it's almost like putting a, uh, uh, what, uh, everyone complains about the, the bomb error. Uh, whenever R crashes on you and you get your, your time bomb error, um, I think that would probably start happening. If, if we were to run this. Or Rex, if you send me a package and I, I run your code, um, it would start throwing things all out of whack. So that's just a really loose-based example, but I think that's what we're getting at. 
Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense to me. Thanks. I want to, I want to jump in. I think there's another, I'm going to pass it in the chat, but there is, um, uh, so there's a package called with R that helps manage this issue of side effects. And, and we'll get to this a little bit later, but I think that the example here kind of really clarifies this even more with this idea of changing the, the system or how the user's system operates. And it specifically does that using the constant pi, right? 3.141593 as defined in R. Um, so there, what could happen is, is that you could write a function that changes the user system to, you know, chop some of those decimal points off to only like 3.14. And so what might happen is, is that you, you make that system change later down the road, if you don't clean up after yourself, the user is going to be expecting that they're using the decimal 3.1. 41593, but your package, how you had it in changing the system, you know, changed it to 3.1. And so it it has, it has like, has those effects that you need to clean up with. And I think we'll get to that a little bit later, but this, I, when I read this like vignette that I passed along, it really clarified to me like what a side effect is and how you should like control for it. And that's what the, with our package does. So. All right. All right. Yeah. Thanks for that. Um, and does segue nicely into the solution, which is using the with our package. Um, and so um, I was checking out the documentation of the page for it, and it does seem very handy um, for creating temporary changes and modifying things um, temporarily. Um, this is just what I've written here. Um, and so the mistake we made was changing the user's overall state. Um, and so if you have to do this, make sure this is documented explicitly or um, try to make it reversible. Um, and I believe that's what the with our package helps with, but it's only temporarily modified. Um, yeah, and that is all I have to present. Um, I'm sure I've made a couple of mistakes along the way. I'll get to see it in a recording, um, but yeah, I appreciate everyone's time. Thanks, Brendan. I, I really appreciate you sharing. I think that was an excellent run through of chapter six. And so I think all of us had some, uh, I thought we all learned a lot and we had a really good discussion centered around it. So um, I guess I'm going to open it up to the floor if anybody has other questions, comments. Okay. That's no question. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, it's just like how to know all the things that can happen. Like I had never seen the the check with the global um, variables. So like um, if one runs into that, what is like the best way of approaching like, you know, passing the check and, and things like that? Um, I welcome any perspectives <laughs> because uh, there seems to be so many new things that could that could happen. <laughs> When I was going to come. Oh, go ahead, Rex. Sorry. Um, when I had that thing where I had to like declare the global variables, I honestly like had no idea, and I think I only really understand what the solution was like now. I definitely just like copy pasted something on Stack Overflow and like, oh, bust. That's happy. <laughs> um, but yeah, yeah, it's pretty. I mean, I just hunted around on Stack Overflow, Overflow until something worked. Maybe not the most elegant like way to learn about what's actually happening. If it works, if it passes. <laughs> I, I was going to say, I would not not hire me in a uh, perspective of uh, coding if if timing and efficiency is is a necessity of the job role. Uh, for me, I often don't boil the ocean, but I will literally spend infinite amounts of time in thinking, wait, uh, you know, trying an error until I figure out exactly what that call is. To Rex's comment of possibly Stack Overflow or you know finding some some other user that ran into the same error and oh magically they ran this one script and it all worked. My my favorite 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 use case of this example happening is Python and environmental var or sorry just Python environments. It is very 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 common when working in Python that you're 
environment or the scripting that you're doing may be outside of your current base Python on the computer. Like, so either like you're loading this other service, um, there's ways that users can find themselves in this arena. And if you're not aware of it, your code's not gonna work. Stopping and comprehending exactly why that call is happening. And then like Colin was mentioning about the, the help documents and, and support documents, going in and comprehending what at a base level is occurring to create the error that you're having, it's very time consuming. And that's my <laughs> reason I would never uh, want uh, myself to be at a position of, I need code out tomorrow, it's not gonna happen. I'm gonna be spending weeks trying to figure out why something's happening. But when, it's, when you get your, when you get your, uh, your uh, finished code, it's gonna be exactly what you need. And I'll give you a doctoral dissertation of why the error occurred you know, afterwards. That's supposed to be a, a comical joke there. Yeah. And I guess just to add, I mean, like, again, anybody who's watching this in the future, I am not a developer, so you can take it for what it's worth. But I think it goes back to like having a debugging workflow, you know, first identifying where is it going wrong, then identifying what's going wrong. And then going a little bit further and figuring out why it's going wrong. Because usually if you can figure out like where the issue's happening and get into that kind of general context, that helps out tremendously. Um, and then once you do that, then you just start figuring out like what is going wrong with it. And then, you know, just kind of figuring out the why. And then, you know, there's a lot of different, different ways to figure out the why. Um, you know, I found the why digging into the help documentation. Cause like, you know, my default was always just go to Google, go to stack overflow, copy, paste, we're good to go. But, you know, to really kind of figure out what's going on really kind of helps. And then like, um, reprexes, reproducible examples. Um, you know, I think a lot of people who talk about like the debugging process, if you go through the process of just creating a reproducible example, and this is more outside of like our command check, because it's probably really hard to reproduce that. But it's part of my debugging workflow where it's like, go through the process of creating a reprex, because sometimes 90% of the time just creating that reprex, you'll solve your problem. And if you can't go over to our studio, our, our, our for ds learning community, <laughs> dump that reprex in there and say, Hey, people who are a lot better at this than I am, you know, solve it. And I think, I think Aaron's our Aaron's actually answered a couple of my questions. So, but um, yeah, it's just that just, it's just having that workflow of where is it going wrong? What's going wrong? Why is it going wrong? And it just kind of helps you frame it that. Um, and I say that without being on a deadline because when you're on a deadline, stack overflow, copy paste definitely does help. So. Thank you. I was going to put a selfless plug in for Tan uh, wearing the Superman cape. Uh, anytime we post things, Tan always jumps in and usually has the answer or at least points you in the right direction for sure. I'm also curious because I think Brendan had a, had a really good question earlier. Um, you know, what are, what are some of the things that people, it's kind of interesting to kind of learn how other people learn about this process, um, you know, how to become a better, you know, I guess, software engineer, if you want to call that, or even just a better statistician, um, because I feel like this, this kind of, you know, R is kind of that melding of, you know, software engineering and statistics and data analysis, you know, what are some of the other things that people do? Because, you know, I come at it from a developer point of view, but does anybody have any other input to that? Yeah, I think I I learned R in a very unstructured way. Uh, so I think for anybody who is like self-taught or just uh, community taught, I think it's uh, what helped me was like learning from other people, typically like best practices, because I feel like even if I could like get things done, I was probably not doing them in the most proper way. Uh, and I think I just really like like watching how other people who are really good at it do it. And I think all these like, oh, there are like really people who are really good at it and have like a, a strong online presence and are very humble and approachable and you know, are good teachers. I like, like uh, watching those people. I think I've like 
learned so much by just like watching uh, videos of Jenny Bryan's lectures. It's like incredible. She, I think like she's probably one of the best, I think, our educators out there, I, I feel like. Uh, yeah, I think one of the resources that I first found most useful was this, was this. What they forgot to teach you about R. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that. I thought that was really useful. David, David Robinson. Oh, yeah. um, David Robinson, he has a whole series. It's not really more, it's more data analysis and data visualization. But he'll pretty much, I don't know if you're familiar with like Tidy Tuesday, um, but um, Tidy Tuesday is a, a weekly kind of thing where a data set gets released and people create visualizations and, and post it onto Twitter. But David Robinson has an entire, I think every week he will go through and sit down for an hour and a, and a half and just walk through his entire process. And I watched several of those videos and I just get blown away at how much I learn because he just goes from like starting from the data set, moving all the way down to a complete visualization. And I have learned a significant amount from watching those videos. Um, trying to think of what else and uh, seeing other people's code. I think digging into people's code and reading it and trying to understand it really helps too. I think that's been something that's really kind of pushed me to like kind of figure out how to be better. I still can't understand the, I still can't understand the tidyverse code. It's just, it's beyond me, but like I try and pick it apart, but you know, if I can learn like one or two things by looking at like some of the source files, that's making me a little bit better too. Yeah, similarly, um, like I'm, I'm not a developer at all. And so uh, when I learned R, it was like to do something often, you know, in a really tight timeline. But now that I'm a little bit more familiar, I'm trying to be more disciplined about reading about um, the various functions and just reading like all of the arguments. What do they do? How do I try them out? Because there's like, you know, there's so many different ways of doing the same thing but then you realize like oh pivot longer already had that in there and I could have used that and you know save myself a lot of headache or um, another one that I thought was really helpful was reading through like all in it our options and just like it's so much like in there um, to like help avoid uh, copy and pasting chunks and things like that and so um, that's one thing I'm, I'm trying to be uh, better at doing now that like you know time is less pressing to um, do things just like going back and seeing can I use this function better there's also I mean I could talk about this all night like seriously I have tips I mean I probably should write a book without many tips I have but nobody's probably going to read it so I, I don't know but anyways uh, I think the other thing too is is like uh, just watching other, well, watching other people is one of them, but, you know, seeking out critiques from other people too, um, you know, trying to contribute. I want to do that myself. I know that's kind of scary of like putting pull requests out in the public for people to like pick it apart, but everything that I read from people that are like, you know, developing their own packages or contributing, they always say that's like the, like the next level up is having another person review your code and give you feedback. And so I think just having, you know, being brave and saying, okay, I'm going to put this out in the open and have people critique it. I can't remember her name. I think I, I want to say she's a developer ad, advocate for um, our studio. I, don't, I can't remember. Is it, is it, uh, I'm going to, I think it's Maya or Mia or something. I, Isabel, I don't know. I, I have to look up. Right? Yeah, I think that might be who it is. Like she made a comment in like a, in like a video that I saw one time where it was just like, you know, put your things out on the internet. And if people are telling you that you're wrong on the internet, that's great because then you're getting free feedback, you know? So I think that was kind of an important thing is, you know, just put yourself out there. Even if you're wrong and somebody corrects you, you're still getting free feedback. And so I don't know, but I should take it. No, go ahead. It's a joke that the quickest way to get an answer is to post the wrong thing on the internet so that somebody goes and corrects you. <laughs> I think that same, 
Well, there was a, I, it, uh, Isabella, if it's the same Twitter uh, uh, post that I saw, it said, um, posted on like Reddit and then uh, our, our Stack Overflow and then sign into another user account and put some snarky comment because somebody's going to jump in and correct you. And so it kind of, uh, you're protecting yourself uh, defensively with that snarky comment ahead of time so nobody else does it for you. Um, I've never posted on a social uh, coding site, Stack Overflow or any other forum uh, uh, posting to ask a question, GitHub issues or any, any of that nature. I'm always cautious because I don't want to appear ignorant, but you're, you're posting the question to be ignorant. Does that make sense? Like you're, you're wanting help with a problem that you're, you're uh, after. And uh, the only way to reach out is have that confidence level or, or I don't know, just know that you're going to probably get somebody that's going to post some bad comment that makes you feel ignorant. But anyway, that could just be me too. And that's the other thing too, is like, I, te I teach this to undergraduates who are just starting out. They've never coded in their life. And the one thing that I always say to them is like, just understand that there's going to be thousands of ways to do what you want to do. It's just figuring out, you know, getting it, moving it from A to B and then optimizing it from there. If you need to optimize it, because there's a situation where you could just like get like the most minimal viable product out there and it's exactly what you need. And so, you know, but there's always somebody out there that will be like, well, I need to pare this down and make it better, or make it faster or, or use a different computing language when, you know, sometimes it's just about getting it to work and then optimizing it from there. So, but again, I, <laughs> I'm trying to give $10 advice. That's probably worth like, you know, 10 cents. So um, take it with a grain of salt. Cool. Uh, does anybody else have any any other questions or anything they want to add? I see we're getting up to the nine o'clock. I mean, I can hang out a little bit longer, but um, you know, I just just kind of make some final remarks before we have any you know closing discussion. Uh, next week will be oh excuse me while I find it. Next week will be Aaron, right? Yeah, be, yeah. So yeah, you'll cover chapter number seven. Uh, we'll be covering our code. And so I'm looking forward to kind of digging a little bit further into that. And then again, if, if anybody's interested on in taking some more chapters, there's some open after number seven, I think. And then uh, other than that, that's, that's, that's all for the group tonight. So excellent work. Great discussion. Great job, Brendan. I really appreciate your time and have a good night, everybody. Thanks so much. Thank you. See you later. Thanks, everyone.